As generative AI sparks conversations across the world, it's clear that ethical use is a hot topic. You know, with the rapid spread across sectors, the chances of stepping into an ethical gray area are pretty high. So in a minute, we're going to talk with Dr. Michael Wesley to dive into a medical field example that lays bare the complex ethical and privacy challenges linked to generative AI usage. Dr. Wesley heads the Neurobehavioral Systems Lab at the University of Kentucky, and his work blends behavioral modeling, functional neuroimaging, and non-invasive brain stimulation. We both serve on our university's advanced team. We're the group developing and advocating for ethical guidelines on generative AI's use by our campus community across educational research, clinical, and service missions. So in a second, we're going to show you just how easy it is for identifiable information to slip through the cracks, even in medical images that were thought to be anonymous. The scenario doesn't just spotlight the risks in healthcare, but serves as a warning for generative AI users in various fields, including education. So a quick note before we get started, the image data we're using comes from the demo data set in the MicroGL software package. One set of images portrays a human face used with the consent of the individual, while the others are composite images from numerous structural brain scans. Here we go. We're looking at software that lets you look at MRI images, and we're going to demonstrate a little bit about how one could actually think they have de-identified information, but actually then reveal actually very identifiable information. Yeah, that's right. If you select the view to be multi-planar. Okay. Yep. Got it. All right, so what you're looking at here is you're looking at just slices of the data in three planes, X, Y, and Z. And from this, of course, like you wouldn't be able to recognize the individual from these data, right? For our example, this would be what someone might think is de-identifiable because of the way that the data are being displayed and what you're seeing in the three different planes. But if you go back to the render. So I go up to yeah, display and I say render. Right. So now we've compiled the data in three dimensions, and obviously you can see external features that are very identifiable. Yes. Yeah, and then if you do the three plus R, it might show all on the same screen. That might be the three planes and the render. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. What's a use case here for a privacy and ethics lesson that we should be thinking about? We, as we were talking about the use of AI, to do all kinds of things, Re assist in research, assist in um, healthcare that may involve identifiable information. In the case of imaging, this would be an example where if you were to share the full 3D data set, even if you didn't have a name associated with it, based on the type of data that were shared and the amount of data that's there, it could be recreated or rendered in a certain way that actually makes it identifiable, even though you may not have a person's name associated with it. And then the idea too is that we're not just dealing with imaging data, but we may have, if this is subject one, for example, a lot of demographic information that's also been de-identified, but we know belongs to subject one. There could be healthcare records associated with subject one. And as soon as you can render this in three dimensions and see the person and it becomes de-identified, you're not, you've not only de-identified the imaging data, but you've also paired this person's image and their visually identifiable information with potentially protected healthcare or research data. Because long before AI came along, we've long known that companies like Facebook and then there was Cambridge Analytica, but every time you accept cookies and you get metadata built, companies have been able to figure out who you are without ever knowing your name. And it's the same sort of thing here, isn't it? Yeah, and that's another good point too, because what's being displayed on in this software is only the three-dimensional data points associated with the image, mm -hmm. right? So they're just numbers in three-dimensional space and voxels, which are three-dimensional pixels. And those numbers have been color-coded so that you can tell the difference between brain and fat and CSF, bone. But in each one of these imaging files, there's also header, what's called header information. Mm. And those are metadata associated with the imaging scan itself. And that might contain data like when the data were collected, uh, what scanner was used, what city, the IP address of the computer that was used. Yeah. And so if someone did not, if they were unaware that there, there are also header information that accompany these 3D data points, mm -hmm. and then they uploaded what they thought was one file of just structural information, 
someone else who knew about header information could easily load the data, but instead of loading the structural data, they could choose to load the metadata and then you would get access to that information. So if you are going to share this type of data for it to truly be de-identified, you might, what we uh, call in your imaging world, skull strip the data so that you can't recreate the external features of the face. But you might also load in the header information to assure that there are no fields in the header information that would that could be used along with the imaging data to de-identify um, a participant based on the metadata or the header data. That's quite a term, skull stripping. But really what it means is you get the benefit of looking at all of the imaging data without the actual visage of the person's face. That's right. If you pull the software back up, mm -hmm. yeah. it can show you an example of skull stripped data. Okay. And then if you go to open standard, I think it's called. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then if you go to uh, MNI 152, yes. this should be an example of just brain data. So the way that they acquired or the way you get to this image is that you basically run an algorithm on the data that can strip away the skull. It recognizes bone. It can separate bone from fat, from CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. So basically the three-dimensional data are just numbers. They may range from zero to a thousand, for example. But the way the data have been acquired, the, for example, the very high numbers are color coded as white, for example. And then that might be like what you're seeing on the screen as white matter. The really, yeah, that's right. And then the lower values, maybe between three and 500, 600, that, that might be gray ma matter, right? So this is just a rendering. But the way the data have been acquired, there's a sequence where when you run it, it really is meant to detect the difference between cerebral spinal fluid, white matter, gray matter, skull, fat. Um, and what you can do is you can start to tease apart those numbers so that you're just left with, for example, in this case, the, the white matter, the gray matter, and, and the CSF, but you've taken away the data points. You basically converted those numbers to zeros. So in, that's color-coded black. And so you, you do not get to see any of the fat or the skull, for example. Those tend to show up as a number that's knowable and you can take it out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. What's the, so what's the bottom line for sort of the, the ethics approach for professionals who are thinking about this kind of data writ large, not just in medicine, I'm in education. We're worried about metadata of learners. You've got HIPAA, we have FERPA. So what do you think we ought to be thinking about? I think that, yeah, the kind of, the big picture here is that it's important to know what you're sharing. And accidents can happen, but e even if something is shared out of ignorance, if it violates one of our rules or one of our ethical principles, that violation has still occurred, even if it's recklessness, even if it's not knowingness. If you want to keep from breaking the rules and try to remain ethical in your healthcare approach or your research approach, it is really important to know what you're sharing, the ins and outs. If you're sharing a type of data that you're not completely familiar with, you might reach out to someone before you share that data to ask for their expertise and their help and really understanding what you're sharing, because there might be things behind the curtain that once you're made aware of them, you can make a more informed decision, a more ethical decision about what you're sharing. Yeah. So if that's in, say, the healthcare field or medical research, that would be a compliance officer, say. And yeah, it could be a, yeah, a compliance officer. And maybe it could be a, a group of people with expertise or shared expertise. So like an IRB, but it might be someone who or a group who has a collection of experts and then that may be trained slightly differently or have familiarity with different aspects of data types so that someone on the group could take your case, for example. Yeah and then help inform and educate yeah. you for what you're doing. Yeah. And yeah, on the education side or the school side, it would be maybe, yeah, the data people in your schools or, yeah, you're a, a set of experts who are familiar with data privacy for students and say, what have I got here? What am I getting into? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. This is a good Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Let me know if I can help out anymore. Will do. Okay. See ya. Thanks. Bye.